Okay. So thank you all for joining us tonight for Our Flag Was Still There with Tom McMillan. A lifelong student of history, Tom McMillan has served on the Board of Trustees at Pittsburgh's Hind History Center, the Flight 93 National Memorial, and the Marketing Committee of the Gettysburg Foundation. He has written, um, I apologize, like this cut off funny, um, three books, The Aftermath and the Legacy of the Courage of 9-11. Three, I... I don't know. I three books. He wrote three books. I, it's weird. It cut off. Um, he recently retired from a 43-year career, um, including 25 years as the Vice President of Communications for the NHL's Pittsburgh Penguins. He has a journalism degree, and he lives here in Pittsburgh with his family. So thanks for being here tonight, Tom. Thank you, Sydney. Thanks, for everyone. And those of you at home, I did write three books, one on Flight 93 and two on the Civil War, and this one. Which kind of leads into people often ask me, you're kind of a Civil War guy. And a few of you folks, familiar faces I see know that. How did you end up writing a book about the Star Spangled Banner and the War of 1812? And it all comes back to the Civil War, as everything always does. My wife and I are actually moving to Gettysburg on Friday. So everything, everything ties into the Civil War. Uh, it, it comes back to the movie Gettysburg, which I know if everyone saw that, it came out in 1993, the four hour epic on that, on that battle. And there's a, powerful fictitious scene uh, right before the start pick, Pickett's charge where the Confederate general Louis Armistead who's going to lead the attack is talking to the British military observer Arthur Fremantle and Fremantle says I understand you're from an illustrious military family and Armistead's getting ready for a battle he doesn't want to talk about this stuff he kind of grunts and he said who told you that General Kemper and Fremantle says he tells me that your uncle was the commander of Fort McHenry during the war of 1812 and therefore was the guardian of the original Star Spangled Banner. Freeman looks across the field to where the American flags are flying above the Union troops that Armistead's about to attack. He says, I do appreciate the irony of it all. And that just stuck with me that, that a Confederate general was the nephew of the guy who defended this flag. Someday I'm going to look into that. So that was 1993. So this is now someday. And I, I looked into it and found it rather fascinating. I hope you will too. Now when we hear the phrase Star Spangled Banner, the first thing we think of is the national anthem. But the words are so familiar to us. We've memorized them as kids. You hear them in every sporting event that we really don't think what they mean. I mean, maybe land of the free, home of the brave, maybe, but not much else. But there's a key line in there. It's not just a bad pun on the last name of the guy who wrote the lyrics. There's a key line in this song, our flag was still there. The song's about the song in our anthem about a specific flag. It's the flag that Francis Scott Key saw waving over Fort McHenry at Baltimore on September 14, 1814, after he had witnessed a 25 hour bombardment of that fort by the British Navy. We'll talk in a bit why he was out there. But the battle's ending that morning. It's misty, it's dark, I'm trying to figure out which flag flies over the port, over the port. Who won the battle? Is it American or British? And they see an American flag. And Key is so inspired that he takes some notes, some notes, and two days later he writes a song that 117 years later becomes the national anthem. But that phrase Star Spangled Banner has also become a generic term for any American flag. Google Star Spangled Banner, go to images, and you'll see lots of photos of the modern 13 strike 50 star flag. Watch the Olympics or other international sporting events, and the announcers will say the Star Spangled Banners are flying in the crowd. Hello. <laughs> As I was saying, <laughs> you can you can tell it. I mean, it's tattered, it's torn, it's really thin. It's got a lot of holes in it. One of the stars is missing. It's eight feet shorter than it used to be, but it's still there. One of the most iconic pieces of early American history. It still exists. And when they were doing the most recent rehab about fifteen years ago, the chief conservator said that they considered the flag a metaphor for the country. With all the challenges we faced over the years, it survives. 
the flag survives if the country survives. And that inspired them as they did their work and it inspired me as I was as I was doing this work. Now that flag exists in the first place because of this man. That's George Armistead, Uncle George, commander of Fort McHenry in 1813. And I, I should say, folks, the War of 1812 was horribly misnamed. It only began in 1812. It lasted for three years. Uh, the early years did not go very well at all for the Americans. Repeated beatings by the British military up in Canada, where most of the early fighting was. One of the few early successes came in the spring of 1813 at a place called Fort George on the Niagara River. And the artillery hero was George Armistead. And he did so well that he was given the honor of presenting captured British battle flags to President James Madison down in D.C. Madison's ecstatic. But Madison and his cabinet then are thinking, you know, the war's going to come down here. We better start protecting our own cities, our own ports, or we're going to be in trouble. Baltimore's a pretty decent-sized city today. It was the third largest city in the country back then. New York, Philadelphia, Baltimore. Bustling international port. Fort McHenry guarded that harbor. It was really going to be a really important spot. Madison knew that, knew that Armistead had served there before the war. They would married a lady from Baltimore, so a lot of this made sense. So he gets the job. One of the first things he did, Armistead always had this thing for the symbolism of big flags. One of the first things he wanted to do, he ordered a flag so large the British couldn't help but see it from a distance. So the story of the flag begins almost as a symbol of defiance, but also a little confidence. This is what we're fighting for, boys. When you sometimes hear in sports, coaches and managers try to create a culture in their locker rooms. That's the culture that George Armistead was trying to create at, at Fort McHenry. He did some other things. Obviously, he had the entries for crude. He had to improve some physical defenses. But the flag was going to be very important to what he did there. The assignment went to a Baltimore seamstress and flag maker named Mary Pickerskill, not Betsy Ross. She had nothing to do with this. Mary Pickerskill's name does not flow off the tongue the way Betsy Ross does. But she uh, she did get the assignment. Unfortunately, that's the only photo we have of her. It's much later in life. She's 37 years old at this time. The assignment actually was for two flags, a gigantic garrison flag, 30 feet high by 42 feet wide. British couldn't help but see that. And a somewhat smaller storm flag, 17 feet high by 25 feet wide. The storm flag would fly in inclement conditions. The big flag flew during a rainstorm, got waterlogged, might get so heavy you'd snap the flag pole. So it needed, it needed those. And it was also designed with, with the style of the time, which was 15 stars and 15 stripes. I've had people who see the cover of the book and come at me on social media. What are you not a patriot? Don't you know that's not the flag? That was the policy back then. We were such a young country. We were adding one star and one stripe for each new state. Imagine what the flag would look like today if that kept going. Uh, 1818, Congress finally said, okay, 13 stripes for the original colonies and one star for each new, new, uh, new state. So Mary and her crew, her all-female crew, get, get to work. It's a really young, all few, uh, really young crew when you consider how important this flag would be in history. Her teenage daughter, two or three teenage nieces, a 13-year-old African-American indentured servant named Grace Wisher. There was also an enslaved girl on premises. Mary had a slave. We don't know what her name was or what her exact role was. She may have done something to make the flag. If not, she at least did the chores to free up the other women to make that flag. So she had something to do with it. They worked long hours for six weeks. Uh, 10, 12 hour days. At one point, the flag was so big, they had to drag it out of Mary's house into a local brewery and spread it out in the floor to continue their work. They finally get it done, middle of August, and Mary's there when it's delivered to Major Armistead at the fort. It flies up the flagpole. And, and he is convinced that any British patrols out in the Chesapeake will see it from a distance. But he's pretty, they've got some pretty good intelligence. He doesn't think there's going to be any fighting that fall or winter. The British are going to head south to warmer waters. We'll see in the spring. Now, spring of 1814, something that's happened that directly affect, affects the pace of this war. England had been involved in a concurrent war over in Europe with the world's other superpower, France, for control of the European continent. 20 years going on. But now France has been defeated. Napoleon's been captured. That frees up thousands of the best soldiers and sailors in the world to come to the U.S. and deal with these upstart former colonists. It really wasn't looking good for the Americans. One of the first things they want to do is mount a symbolic attack on the young, new capital city of Washington, D.C. It's not really strategic. strategic. There's not much there. A couple of buildings and pasture at that, at that point. 
but it's it's symbolic for the British. It's almost we can do whatever we want. They know it won't be they it won't be well defended. We can even take their capital city if we want. They land forty seven hundred troops on the coast, forty five hundred crack veteran British troops just off beating Napoleon in Europe. But two hundred escaped American slaves. The British had taken the moral high road that spring, got word out that any enslaved person who could make it to a British ship would get his or her freedom. About 4,000 enslaved people got their freedom that spring that way. They didn't have to fight, but the men had an opportunity, uh, if they wanted to, to sign up for military training and fight against their former masters. And about 600 did, and 200 were in this campaign. They were in their own unit called the Colonial Marines to distinguish them from the famed British Royal Marines. So they're part of the campaign. They're a small part of it, but they were there. Now, the British are marching toward D.C. The American army, such as it was, puts up a defensive line at a place called Bladensburg, Maryland. It is one of the most humiliating days in Mer- American military history, August 24th, 1814. The British blew right through. I mean, there was fighting, there was bloodshed, there were injuries, but it didn't take very long. In fact, in history, if you look at it, it's not it called not so much the Battle of Bladensburg as the Bladensburg races. The Americans ran away so quickly. The British took very little time to reorganize. That same day, they watched, marched right into D.C., into the Capitol, into the White House, and set fire to both buildings. They don't burn them to the ground, but they do significant damage. This is an image that someone drew of the White House. Uh, damage after the, what would that have done to the American psyche? And that was the British purpose. They wanted, we can do whatever we want. If you tour those buildings today, you can still see in the lower floors some of that fire damage from August 24th, 1814. The British have no other purpose in D.C. They, they just came to do this. So they leave within 24 hours. Their next attack is much more strategic, this port city of Baltimore. And had they gone immediately, it's only 40 miles, they probably would have been, would have been successful. We'd be telling a completely different story about our country today. For reasons I put in the book, a lot of reasons, they decide they're going to go back to the ships. Hindsight's 2020, so they march back. And the battle will happen in three weeks. On the way back, something happens that directly leads to our anthem. During this time when the British were on campaign, the foot soldiers would sleep in tents or on the ground. The commanders would take over a nice house in the air. And on their way in at Upper Marlboro, Maryland, they stopped at a place owned by the elderly physician, Dr. William Beans. Beans treats them well. I mean, what's he going to do? And they notice he has a Scottish brogue. And they say, this guy's okay. He's going to be neutral. On the way back, they come the same way. And the armies always have some straggling young soldiers lagging behind for loot or booze. Well, Beans and his friends don't like it. They go out and capture them. They take them prisoner. Word gets back to the British ships, and they are furious. They send a detachment, middle of the night, grab old man Beans out of his bed, shake him. We're going to take you back to our ships, take you up to Halifax in Canada. You might never see your family again. Family and friends are mortified. They engage a local attorney, whose name we all know now, Francis Scott Key, and ask Key, will he go and nego- try to negotiate Dr. Beans' release? And Key says, I'll try, but they don't know who I am. So he's teamed up with the U.S. prisoner of war exchange agent, Colonel John Skinner. So Key and Skinner are the negotiating team. They go to Baltimore, get in a ship on September 3rd, while looking for the British in the Chesapeake. They don't know where they are. It takes them four days. September 7th, they find the fleet. The British know Skinner. They welcome them aboard. Folks, this is less than a week before the Battle of Baltimore. The British are deep in the deep in the planning for that battle. They don't have time to talk to these two guys about the only doctor. It's not going well. A couple of days later, Key finally breaks the logjam. He pulls out some letters that he's collected from wounded British soldiers at Bladensburg who are being treated well by American doctors. And the admiral's got other stuff. He says, okay, if you treat our guys well, we'll let the old man in. Great, Key says. We'll go back to Baltimore tonight. Uh, not so fast, pal. You've been out here hearing our plans for attacking Baltimore. We can't send you in, or the attack's going to be tomorrow. So Key's not a prisoner, but they're detained on their own ship under guard. And we think they were probably tethered to the Admiral's ship. So Skinner was a U.S. government official. The British knew they were going to win the battle. He could maybe facilitate the surrender of the Americans. So that's why Key had such a, a, a good view of what was going to go on in this battle. Now, the Battle of, of Baltimore starts... The next day, September 12th, you see where Fort McHenry is up there and where the ships are going to be, but it actually starts down here. They land at North Point. It's, they're just going to use the Army to start. Maybe it's going to be Bladensburg. We won't even need the Navy. Drive into Baltimore. But the Baltimore militia fights pretty well. 
They gave up ground, but they stopped them a few miles short of the city. So the British are now going to need the next morning their navy to bomb Fort McHenry and get in a, in a pincer move. Bomb, bomb Fort McHenry to smithereens. British Navy was the most outstanding in the world at the time. Their most lethal weapon was a short, stubby thing called a bomb ship. They could fire 200-pound cast iron bombs more than two miles. They had eight of these in their entire worldwide inventory. Five of them were at the mouth of the Patapsco River in Baltimore that morning. Volcano, devastation, terror, Etna, mercury, even the names meant business. 6.30 in the morning, you see where they are. On September 13th, Volcano fires the first shot. Begins a barrage over the next 25 hours of 1,500 bombs and 700 rockets. These crazy Congreve rockets. They weren't very accurate, just for psychological damage. But red streaks through the sky. The rockets red glare. Pounding Fort McKenna. Did the Americans fire back? Yes, they did. But their guns only had a range of a mile and a half. The shots are splashing short, and the British are taunting them. <laughs> you can't hit us. Now, the British a couple times did move their ships closer for accuracy, and the American Marmistead has men fire. The Americans scored some hits. But the British just pulled back. So most of this defense is a, is a passive defense. Military people will tell you that's the most difficult. You sit there and take it. There's nothing you can do. But Armistead is convinced that his men are not going to give up this fort. It's not going to be the Bladensburg races. Early afternoon, it starts to rain. Most of the rest of the battle is fought in a torrential downpour. What happens? Big flag comes down. Storm flag goes. The storm flag flew for most of the battle. Now, did Key see the flag overnight? One of the things that's really difficult in this kind of research, maybe why no one's going to try to write a book before, is Key left us very little detail other than the lyrics of his song. He never wrote about it in detail. He never did an interview with a newspaper. He did a speech a few decades later, but it was mostly on the emotion of what he felt. So we don't know. All we have is those lyrics. Rockets, red glare, bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. It could have been a bomb burst. And he was the burst, he would have seen the flag, that's possible. But some historians think that merely because the fact that the firing continued meant the Americans had not given up and the flag would have still been there. So we're never going to know. Are those mysteries of history? Early the next morning, September 14th, dawn is just breaking. Rain is stopping. It's really misty. It's dark. The firing is petering out. Key beans and Skinner are looking. What, what's happening? Who's won? Through the spy glasses. Which flag is there? You can see an American flag. They probably first saw the storm flag, but at nine o'clock, something happens that again directly leads to the anthem. Now, there are flag raising ceremonies at every US military installation, but that morning it was different. The men gathered around, they cheered and shouted and sang and played music and fired guns and taunted the British. It was a moment of victory. And we have two first person accounts one American, one British. The American soldier said, At this time, a morning gun was fired, the flag hoisted. Yankee Doodle played, Yankee Doodle, and we all appeared in full view of, of a formidable and mortified enemy. At the same time, a young British sailor, as they're pulling back from the harbor, says, it was a galling spectacle for the British seamen to behold. As the last vessel spread her canvas to the wind, the Americans hoisted the most superb and splendid ensign on their battery and fired at the same time a gun of defiance. This is the moment in key season. He's taking his notes. Now, Key's not released immediately. The British had no plans for what they were going to do if, if they didn't win the battle. So they had to decide for a few days what they're going to do. It's not until September 16th, two days later, they decide we're pulling out completely. And then Key is released, and he, Beans, and Skinner sail back into Baltimore on the 16th, past, past the fort, past the flag. And Key takes a room that night, and he writes the four verses of his song. Now, if you're like me, and almost every American, you've heard the story that Key wrote a poem. He wrote a poem, and somebody noticed going after that that, well, this poem fits exactly with this musical tune, even though it's a very difficult musical tune. What a miracle! It must be a message from God. It didn't happen that way. The tune that we now know is the Star Spangled Banner. Very well known to Francis Scott Key and many Americans in 1814. It had been written in 1770 over in England for an upscale British gentleman's club. The other myth is that it was a British drinking song, like it was 100 bottles of beer on the wall or something. These guys were aristocrats. 
they would get together for sumptuous dining and fine wine, and they fancied themselves great singers, and they wanted a song to challenge their vocal range. So the club was named for the ancient Greek poet Anacreon. The club was called the Anacreonic Society, and their theme song was to Anacreon in heaven. And it is going to be your pleasure here to hear me sing a little bit. I'll do it quickly, <laughs> but just for effect. So sorry, it's for, this is recorded, isn't it? That's too bad. Okay, well, I'll, I'll do my best. So an Akron in heaven, where he sat in full glee, a few sons of harmony sent a petition that he, their inspirer and patron, would be when his answer arrived from the jolly old Grecian. Who I'm not going to do the rest, but you get the point. It's just silly lyrics. Uh, nonetheless, the, the society concept was very popular, spread across the ocean to the U.S. There were societies in, in America, big one in New York City. And what happened then, they would take, rather than constantly rewriting music, they would take popular tunes and merely rewrite the lyrics. Lyrics were rewritten to this song many times by 1814. Sometimes for silly, just silliness for fun, sometimes activism, sometimes politics. One of the most popular, 1798 for President John Adams, song titled To Adams and Liberty. That fame to the world, so the America's voice, no trees can her son from the government sever. The pride is her Adams, her laws are her choice, and shall flourish to liberty, slumbers forever. Then unite on and on and on. And again, silliness, but. Uh, there were nine verses to this song. It didn't work very well because Adams lost the next election to Thomas Jefferson. But nonetheless, it was a very popular song and people knew it. Francis Scott Key himself had written lyrics to this tune in 1805, nine years before the Battle of Fort McHenry. The U.S. Navy had won a big victory over in the Middle East. They were honoring one of the sailors down in D.C. They asked Key to write something to honor him. And Key wrote a song called When the Warrior Returns. When the warrior returns from the battle afar, the home and the country nobly defended, a warm be the welcome to gladden his ear, and loud be the joy that his perils are ended. But look at the end. He's rhyming, wave and brave, wave and brave. How's the anthem end? Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave or the land of the free and the home of the brave. Here we have, where mixed with the olive, the laurel shall wave and form a bright wreath for the brows of the brave. Not only that, but in the little-known third verse of this little-known song, there's this passage, the pale beam, the crescent, its splendor obscured by the light of the star-spangled flag of our nation. Francis Scott Key in 1805. Do you think he was writing a poem? No, he was writing lyrics to this song and he even tried out some concepts. The next morning, September 17th, three days after the battle, Key takes this, these verses to the home of his brother-in-law, Judge Joseph Nicholson, who was one of the militia soldiers fighting at Fort McHenry. Nicholson reads it and he's overwhelmed. He's like, we have to get this out. Now, the, all the businesses, they close during the battle, including the newspapers, but they get a young pressman. He opens the office and they print a one page broadsheet with the lyrics, print 1,000 copies, and they distribute them that day to soldiers, other dignitaries in Baltimore. This is the first way Americans, people in Baltimore saw it. Defense of Fort McHenry. He never called his song the Star Spangled Banner, he never called it anything. He just wrote the lyrics. We think that Nicholson or one of his friends gave it this accurate but very mundane title of Defense of Fort McHenry. See right here, tune, Anacreon in Heaven, three days after the battle. So that was writing it as, as a song. Now, it is the first time we think that it was called the Star Spangled Banner was about a month after this. It was The song was performed at a theater in Baltimore. And Perhaps a music store owner in, in Baltimore was the first person to call it the Star Spangled Banner, and the name stuck. People loved it. This song was very popular, one of the leading patriotic songs. But it wasn't the anthem. We didn't have an anthem. There were still many patriotic songs left over from the Revolution. Yankee Doodle, Yankee Doodle Hail Columbia, Columbia, the Gem of the Ocean, uh, Civil War Comes Along, Battle of Him, the Republic, many popular songs. The Union Army did kind of adopt this during the Civil War. They would play it when uh, watching it to liberate Confederate cities. Uh, but it wasn't until the late 1880s that it became the official anthem of the U.S. military. And then not until 1931, several organizations, political and or, um, patriotic and, and veterans groups, uh, the VFW, the American Legion, the Daughters of the American Revolution, the Daughters of 1812, got behind the Maryland congressman. Uh, from Baltimore and pushed through a bill that made the Star Spangled Banner the National Anthem, 1931. I think Francis Scott Key would have been astonished to find that his song became the National Anthem. So that's the story of the song. What about the flag? 
George Armistead, now Lieutenant Colonel Armistead, he was promoted by President Madison after the battle. Sometime a year or two after the battle, he takes the flag down from a flagpole, takes it home as a souvenir, in complete violation of Army regulations. <clears throat> he basically stole the flag. It remained in the private possession of the Armistead family for 90 years until George's grandson gave it to the Smithsonian in 1907. That's why it still exists today. When did it happen exactly? We don't know, but it happened before 1818 because George died in 1818. Probably of a heart condition. His wife thought that condition developed during or right after the battle, which makes sense. So from 1818, the ownership goes to his wife, Louisa. Louisa Armistead is the longest private owner of this flag, more than 40 years. 1818 until her death in 1861. She guards it zealously. Not because of patriotism. People, the song wasn't the anthem. Most people outside of Baltimore didn't even know the flag exists. It was her husband's heirloom. It was a family heirloom. That's why she protected it. It didn't even make a public appearance for 10 years, until 10 years after the battle, 1824, only because the Marquis de Lafayette was making his grand tour of the U.S. and his big ceremonies in New York and Philly and Boston. He's coming to Baltimore. Louisa brings the flag. They fly it up the flagpole. And someone makes a sign that says, Welcome Lafayette to the land of the free and the home of the brave. And sadly, that's the last time, 1824, that flag flew from the flagpole at the Roman Catholic. I can only document three or four times, maybe four times, in the next 30 plus years that the, song, that the flag is out in public. They had a battle anniversary every year, made it for a couple of those. An Armistead descendant or a relative was uh, running for political office, made it his campaign. That's about it. But during this time, Luisa's partner in protecting the flag was her daughter, Georgiana. And she was named for her father, Georgiana Armistead, born in McHenry in 1817. Uh, they protected the flag as well as they could, given the methods and technology at the time, but they also did something we consider sacrilegious today. They cut off pieces of the flag and gave them the souvenirs. Military veterans, their families, local dignitaries, some of these people who just asked. You know, I was talking to somebody at the Smithsonian. They say, we would be aghast at that today, but don't blame them. That was commonplace back then. That's what people did. Get a piece of the flag. Over the years, the Armistead ladies cut away eight feet. So that flag in the Smithsonian today is not 30 by 42. It's 30 by 34. And it's jagged at the end. People go there and think that's battle damage. That's not battle damage. That's Armistead lady cutting damage. <laughs> but again, it's it's what happened at the time. Nonetheless, they protect the flag. Louisa dies in 1861, just after the start of the Civil War. And by the terms of her will, she had four children. They were going to fight over the flag. By the terms of her will, it goes to her daughter, Georgiana, now married, goes by the name Georgiana Armistead Appleton. And it gets really interesting because Georgiana and many of her family members are Confederate sympathizers. Her first cousin, Louis Armistead, is Confederate general, be it Pickett's charge. And it's not really surprising in Maryland for people who know the Civil War, because Maryland, it's a northern state, but it's a border state, slave state. Maryland sent troops to both the Union and the Confederacy. The Lincoln administration was terrified that Maryland would bolt and join the Confederacy. It would not only tip the balance of power, but it would physically cut off Washington, D.C. from the rest of the North. They had to protect it. They went to extreme measures. They rescinded habeas corpus. You could arrest anyone you wanted, hold them for as long as you wanted. They arrested pro-Southern legislators, pro-Southern city officials, pro-Southern newspaper writers, even tried to prevent young men from leaving to join the Confederate Army. It was a night in early September when they had a tip that some men were going to get on a boat and go to Richmond. They arrested them, ran their names in the paper the next day. One of the names was George Armistead Appleton, the grandson of the hero of Fort McHenry. He had in his back pocket a Confederate flag. They're going to take him to a major Union prison, but the first night, where is he held? Fort McHenry. Armistead's grandson is a prisoner at Fort McHenry. It gets better. The next week, mid-September, they arrest one of the most strident pro-Southern newspaper writers, Frank Key Howard. Frank Key Howard, the grandson of Francis Scott Key. Where's he taking that first night? To Fort McHenry. And folks, this is September 13th, 1861. 47 years to the day. To the day that his grandfather saw the bombs bursting in air. He wasn't happy. He angrily wrote, As I stood upon the very scene of that conflict, I could not but contrast my position with his 47 years before. The flag which he had then so proudly hailed 
I saw waving at the same place over victims of, a, of as vulgar and brutal a despotism as modern times have witnessed. That was the view of Key's grandson. Five of his brothers, five other Key grandsons were Confederate soldiers. One had the very eerie name of McHenry Howard. And McHenry Howard was a staff officer for Stonewall Jackson. Now, during this time, the Armistead ladies still protect the flag. Again, it's not for American patriotism. It's for family patriotism. But thankfully, they did. If, if Confederate activists had gotten that flag, it would not exist today. So the war ends and countries coming back together. You don't hear much about the Star Spangled Banner. Memory has faded into oblivion. It's not until 1873 when this man, little known to history, brings it out of the shadows. That's Commodore George Preble, lifetime Navy man. He's written a book on the history of the U.S. flag. One of the things he can't figure out is what happened to the original Star Spangled Banner for Fort McHenry. He's heard it might be with some Armistead descendants, but he believes a story that he read somewhere uh, that soldiers were through Fort McHenry in the 1850s. They saw a big flag rolled up in the corner collecting dust. That, he thinks, is the Star Spangled Banner. Well, that brings Georgiana Armistead Appleton out of the woodwork. She writes him an angry, how dare you? How dare you? That's my father's flag. It's in my possession. That was like, whoa. Uh, they write back and forth, though, and after all, Georgiana gets her head turned by the fact that this military man from Boston is interested in her flag. Preble says, has it, ever, has it ever been photographed? No. Well, if you send it to me here at the Boston Naval Yard, I'll take a photograph and, and, and send it to So she does. She puts it in the crate, sends it to Boston. This guy's all fired up. He's going to get it out and put it up a flagpole. He takes it out. It's, it's pretty weak. 60 years old. It needs a backing. He's in a naval yard. They have old ship sails. So he has some sailors sew a ship sail to the flag. He then hangs it from the side of a building. That's the first photo, 1873, 59 years after the battle ever taken of the flag. You can see the star is missing. And some of the parts of it has been cut off. It's great that for context, he puts a soldier standing there. You see how big it is. It looks backward, though, right? It is backward. For reasons we can never know, never explain, no soldier, soldiers sewed the sail to the front of the flag. So it's displayed backwards for more than 100 years. There's an unintended benefit of that, which I'll get to at the end. But nonetheless, that's that's why it looks. Like, you'll sometimes see people will flip they'll flip the uh, the negative, but that's the that's the way it was in uh, in real life. Now, Preble keeps it for a few years in Boston. Does a couple of events, but it's still gaining no national fame. 1876, Georgiana says, "Oh, my flag back." She's living in New York City at the time with another son, a New York City stockbroker, and it goes to them. And then she dies in 1878, and at that point, by the terms of her will, they kept passing this flag by their will. It goes to that son, Ebenezer Stuart Appleton. Ebenezer's a pretty good name for this guy. He's a little bit of a Scrooge. When we look at him, he's prim, he's proper, he's not going to be a good PR person. And much to his chagrin, the obituary says he's now the owner of the flag, so he gets all these requests. He doesn't want to do any of them. But there's one he feels he has. 1880, Baltimore is putting up a statue to his grandfather. He says, okay, he takes the flag, he rides in the parade in a big wagon, Key's granddaughter is there, some battle veterans are there, it's a great event. But he gets back to New York, it's 1880, and he says, that's it. He locks it in a vault, no one outside the family sees the flag again for 27 years. Not that they don't try. The Baltimore City Fathers, 75th anniversary, 1889. Ask very politely, can we have the flag in Fort McHenry? Nope. So they write to the Secretary of War. They go over his head and they say, you know, this isn't really George Armistead's flag. He took it. It's government property. You could get it back. And the Secretary says, I agree with you, but possession is nine-tenths of the law. And Eben, uncharacteristically, first time in his life, conducts a PR campaign. He gets some New York reporters to come to his apartment. He holds up a portrait of his grandfather and says, does this look like a Facebook man who would steal government property? Even though he, even though he did. And then he gives them this unbelievable quote. The government does not own the flag. And they're demanding it, I think, would equal any despotic notion displayed by the Tsar of Russia. I will loan it where and to whom I please. I will protect it as long as I live and leave it in good hands when I die. No one's getting the flag. Uh, but early 20th century, Evans getting into his 60s. He's tiring of this. He's thinking donating maybe Baltimore, maybe the state of Maryland. 
There is a cousin who has a government job down in D.C. And he says, you know, there is this relatively new National Museum, the Smithsonian. National Museum. He really only took a couple of letters. And he decides he's going to loan the flag. You can do that. You still retain ownership. You loan it for a certain number of years. Send it to the Smithsonian 1907, the first day. They get it out and they hang it from the side of the original Smithsonian building called the Castle. It still exists. It's it's the business center. The building still exists. Business center. Looks like a castle. That's hanging the flag. And it's published in a number of newspapers. This is the first time most Americans, in 1907, that the flag from 1814 still exists. It touches off a huge surge of patriotism and visitation to the Smithsonian. Evan is so pleased that five years later, 1912, he makes the gift permanent. With one stipulation, the flag will never leave the Smithsonian. He's like, great, whatever you want, that's what we'll do. Two years later, 1914, I think only coincidentally on the 100-year anniversary of the battle, Smithsonian folks are looking, this flag's pretty, it's pretty beat now. We need to do something. The leading flag preservation expert in the country is a lady from Boston named Amelia Fowler. She gets the contract. She and her, and by the contract, her 10 needlewomen, they go to D.C. And here they are working on the flag. And that's in the room. It's now the visitor center. They conclude that one of the problems is the sail is too heavy. They need to remove that and replace it with a, a much finer, thinner backing of fine Irish linen. But they do so with the technology of the time. They apply it with 1.7 million stitches. One of the curators today, curators at the Smithsonian said, I can't believe they put 1.7 million stitches in our flag. And they put it on the wrong side again. But it preserved it for about for about 90 years. So was Ebenezer Appleton's uh, edict that the flag never leave the Smithsonian ever violated? Only once. 1944, World War II, 1942, I'm sorry, World War II, uh, we're concerned about some of our most treasured items. So items belonging to Washington, Jefferson, Lincoln, and the Star Spangled Banner are taken to a warehouse in rural Virginia. And they're all kind of off campus for two years. 1944, we think things are safe, comes back. Star Spangled Banner has been on display, folks, to the American public every day since then in some way, shape, or form. But 1964, things are getting a little bit cluttered. We'll say there's junk there. It's all great stuff, but there's just so much stuff there. And no one's seen the full flag since 1907. It's a big case, 16 feet high, but the flag's 30 feet high. It's full. You only see eight stripes. They decide they're going to create a new museum just for American history, the National Museum of American History. It will be built around the Star Spangled Banner, and Flag Hall will be on the second floor. This is the way the flag was displayed for about 30 years, the 60s to the 90s. That's when I first saw it. They obviously artificially filled in the stripes and the star, but you can see where the originals are. It was striking and very dramatic. They had great events here, presidential inaugural balls. The flag was pretty well protected, but they check it on occasion in dust and dirt and threads from people's blue jeans. So late 1990s, Smithsonian says, we better do something to preserve this for the really long time where we're going to lose it. So they come together, come up with a multi-year, multi-million dollar plan it would take about eight years. They decide that the whole time they're working on it, it'll be in front of the public. So if you go to the Smithsonian, you'll still be able to see at least part of the flag. One of the first things they have to do is remove those 1.7 million stitches. How'd you like that job? <laughs> Suspended over the flag. They can't touch it. It took them 10 months, one stitch at a time. And the chief conservator, Suzanne Thomasin Krause, who did such a great job with this whole project, you know, people would be watching it. One day she looks up and she sees a multi generational family where the older guy seems to be World War II ill. She goes back to her job 25 seconds or so later. She looks up, he's standing at a pension salute. And then, you know, when you've been doing this for five or six hours, and your back aches and your shoulder aches and your knee aches, that's why you do it. You do it for the American public. So the new display, they get all their great work. The new, new display opens in 2008. That's the way you see it today. You go down a dark corridor and get some history of the battle and key and the White House. And you turn around and you see the flag. And it's almost like it's on an altar. And the one thing that struck me, it's so bright. That's because the front of it was covered for 100 years. That's the unintended benefit. Even though it was unfortunate that happened, it's, it, the, the, the color just pops today after 209 years. And it really, it kind of stuns you to silence. You're, you're looking at that and you know, loud school groups are there. They're, they're, they're silent. 
military veterans are dabbing at their advice. It, really, it, it has that effect on people. If you've seen it, if you haven't, I suggest going down it. It's, it's a special moment for Americans. But I was thinking, I went down there a lot during the research, and I think all the people who had to work together over the centuries didn't know each other, were working together to make sure that flag is still there. George Armistead, who thought of it and defended it, Mary Pickerskill, who made it, Louisa and Georgiana protected it all those years. Uh, Commodore Preble brought it out of the shadows. Ebenezer Appleton, and for all his cantankerousness, got it to the Smithsonian. Amelia Fowler did her preservation work. So everyone who's worked on it since then, and the lady Suzanne Thomason Krauss, who oversaw the re rest restoration to Jennifer Jones, who's the current curator. It's because of them, again, working together over the centuries that we can know that our children, our grandchildren, and many generations out in the future go to the Smithsonian and say, our flag is still there. Thank you. Now, if you see it, that's not battle damage. You can, you can, if you know the story, you can see where they cut it. And they wrote on it. That's what they did in the house. Is that like the star missing as well? Is that a yes, yes. I have a. No one knows where the star is. Uh, I do an appendix in my book where I have a theory. I have no backing, just a theory, because I gotta believe. I would have to believe. And some people often ask. Some of these pieces have been returned. The Smithsonian displays some of them. Some of them are in people's homes. There's one in a bar in Baltimore, and some probably have been lost. They're not going to put them back, but they do collect them. Um, and if, if people have them, they'll, they'll certainly take them. Nobody knows about the star. Uh, so my theory, and it's just a theory, is that they gave it to Lafayette in 1824. Because the only, the only Georgiana Armistead was young when it happened. She said, my mother told me they gave it to some important person. Thanks. I better believe that they gave it to any American. His family or her family would know. And they would either still have it or they would have buried it. There would, there would have been very, great pride. Lafayette got so much stuff. He took it home to France. He wouldn't have, They wouldn't know what this star was. I don't know if that's true or not, but it's the most plausible thing that I could come up with. But yeah, that's the, 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 the big hole. And people also think that that was a, a, a bombshell. One through. It was. It was not. There are all sorts of myths and stories about this. But it's plausible where you you look at that. But see how thin it is there. It's just rather amazing that it's still here. Though. And people often ask about the storm flag. It's never been found because it probably continued to fly and weathered out. And that's what would have happened to this flag if Armistead hadn't taken it home, because it wasn't like sometimes with history, things become historic years later or important years like right then. The battle, they don't know if the British are coming back. The battle might not be over. The anthem doesn't become the anthem. The song doesn't become the anthem until 1931. So it wasn't all that important. And it probably would have continued to fly and weathered out and we wouldn't have it today. So that, that lack of indiscretion of taking it home, uh, breaking all the rules is, is why it's still there and his, his family, you know, preserved it. So I, I thought it was just a fascinating story. So I'm flabbering on. Any other questions? Yes. When did they start placing the stars on the flag as each state, as each entity became a state? With the 14th and 15th state. I'm sorry. With the 14th and 15th state, because they, they there were 13 stars. Or the yes, but I state. mean, when did they start adding the stars as each state? You know what I mean? There are, we have, what, 40, 40, we have 50 stars. Now. Yeah. As, well, this is, so this is. 1814, by them she made 1813. But when they began making flags with the stars. Yes, yes, yes. And and actually there were there were 18 states at this point, but they, they were having a problem. They had added two and they thought, what are we going to do? And then that's why Congress in 1818 said, we can't keep doing this. It, it, it won't work. We can do the stars, we can't keep doing the stripes. How big, either the stripes are going to be you know, look, you look like a candy cane or uh, or the flags would be gigantic. So and thankfully they, they came up with, uh, with that idea. Is there any special lighting on there to help um, fight against like fading? Yes, yes. It is, it, it, first of all, it's very light. It's at a 10 degree angle. It's in a low oxygen chamber. You can get really close to it, but it's a low. And yeah, the light, they, they did all that technical scientific work to preserve it as long as we can. And they're very calm that that'll happen. They go in occasionally to check that. It is not, there's has been no damage since then. So they're they're encouraged that this will be for the long term. Um, certainly will outlast us. 
Does the Smithsonian have any other holdings of George Armistead? Okay. <laughs> my wife asked me a question. Oh, There's a plan. Because I get to this story. This is what it, I write about this in appendix two. This is my favorite story of this project. Of the books I've done. This is my favorite story of any book I've done. I tracked down some direct Armistead descendants who lived in Philadelphia, second great grandson and third great grandson. So in the research, I go to their house in Philadelphia and they're great folks. And talk to them. And they didn't have a lot of information, but they had a couple of things. And I had to go to the bathroom. So I said, can I go? And they said, his wife said, yeah, just go upstairs, typical suburban house, zigzag stairs, make a left at George. It's a portrait of George Armistead just outside the bathroom. So, so, I, said, wow. so I came, I'm coming down the stairs. I look at it. I say, oh, that's the replica of the one I sat to Smithsonian. Come down in a place where you see, you know, Little League photos and high school diplomas and certificates of achievement. Three kind of looks a little strange. So I'm looking at them. They're signed by John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, and James Madison. They were George Armistead's original U.S. Army commissions in their house in Philadelphia. And the second great grandson was Harry. I said, Harry, you can't have this in your house. <laughs> and, and I said, and I saw the photo up there, the replica of the one. And they said, no, no, no. The replica is at the Smithsonian. That's the 1816 painting on the second floor outside the bathroom with no protective covering. <laughs> so they said, you know, we're downsizing. I said, I know someone at the Smithsonian. So those items are now at the Smithsonian. Oh, really? So they, they, so that's kind of a cool little, sometimes you, you, you never know that's going to happen. I talked to the, the third great grandson who's in his 40s named George Armistead. It's really interesting when you're doing this kind of research. And somebody calls you, and the little screen in your car says, George Armistead is called. Hey, George, what happened in 1850? Uh, and he said, You know, it's really, it's really amazing. This stuff was in my house all my life. I didn't take it for granted, but I saw it every day. It's kind of cool the next time I see it, it's going to be at the Smithsonian. Even those guys have that feeling because you just, just, that's how we lose things, though, right? I mean, God bless them keeping them. And they, they wanted to keep them, they could, but clearly they kind of wanted that. They had an opportunity to do it. And Smithsonian authenticated everything, took it a little longer. It was right during COVID. So it took a little longer because they couldn't go to their house, but they authenticated the three commissions and, and the portrait. And those are now saved for American history. So it's really, when you're looking at, you look at John Adams and Thomas Jefferson's signatures, this is, this is pretty strange. That they actually signed. I mean, we see replicas. They they signed those. Books. So, uh, that was an interesting. Thank you for that question. <laughs> and if anyone from home has any questions, feel free to type them in the chat or unmute yourself. I have a chat pulled one. up on my phone. You do? Okay, there's one. Chat. Yeah. Yes. What's your process for putting something like this together? I mean, you did discover these little bits. Of yeah, pieces of you, I, I, it, it is a puzzle. I've, I've done four books. I, you do them all different. I'm one of those. I can't complete all the research and only then write. I, I do a fair amount of research and I get so excited. I have to start writing and see what you have. And then you continue researching. And when you do it that way, sometimes you go back and correct things and add them. But that's what it, it's, it's that process. It's the. I don't know that I, I could never write a book that I wasn't in. Or that I couldn't get ever get an assignment to write a book. Like part of it is you learn that I learned doing this. I was really, as a pretty good student of history, I was embarrassed at how little I knew about this story. A little most, I mean, we, we, uh, yeah, the, there was a battle and Key was on the ship and they saw the flag and he wrote the song and they won the war. Okay. And that's what we know. And, and, and there's so much more <laughs> to this story. The Smithsonian does a pretty good job, but you can only, you can only have so much detail in it. Is, how did Betsy Ross legend get into this? I mean, that's what we learned in school. I know. I know. And, and well, I think not that I've researched her a lot for the original one, but she, a grandson in the 1800s wrote that she did the original flag for George Washington. Such a great story. She was a flag maker in Baltimore. She probably did make flag for the Revolutionary Army. Did she make the original one? Did she design it? So there's a man named Francis Hopkinson, not really known in history, who's kind of given more credit for actually designing the flag. But the Betsy Ross story, I mean, myths through history are just intoxicating, right? You want to believe them. And the Betsy, it was just in Philly, the Betsy Ross house was there. But she, she did make flags. So it's it's not all myth. Mm -hmm. But the myth, I think, that she made the first flag for General Washington. And this one is just because she's associated with any flag. When people hear Star Spangled Banner, they're, 
people going to the Smithsonian, they're not going for this. And they hear it and they don't know which flag it is. But there were numerous times, there were all the school groups there, when I, hear, I would hear the moderator say, now we're going to go see the Betsy Ross flag. It's just what, that's just the things that, that were tired and they stick. It, like he wrote a poem. Like it's a British drinking song. You hear those things. Those are great stories to tell. And I, I would tell friends that I was doing this book about it. They said, oh, it's a British drinking song. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> Hopefully you read the book, but you're you're never you're never going to turn that back. We with with all of history, we need stories. That's what gets people interested in history. The movie Gettysburg that I talked about is half true and half fantasy, but it got a lot of people interested in the battle. So there's value to historic fiction. We just kind of have to understand that we're reading it that it's only this fiction. And if you're interested more, dig into it. And that's, you know, that's what I did here. And this, speaking, starting this, I had no idea that whether there was going to be enough information for a book. You don't know that. Because nobody had done it before, so why haven't they done it? Maybe nobody was just interested. He didn't leave us a lot, but, you know, and, uh, you know, I said descendants certainly helped. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that kind of, so I, I, I found enough, and I thought, this is pretty fascinating. So... So you, uh, I've started some books that I didn't finish because that there's not enough here, or I, you know, I'm not really into doing because it. it's it's a lot of work. You know, nobody except David McCullough and famous people make money writing books. You don't do this when they fun. You're you're hoping to break even for your expenses. You do it because you love. The Armistead family know that you wrote the book about Armistead and Hancock. Oh yeah, they did. They did. And the the George Armistead people are mad that Louis Armistead is more famous than George. Because George did the flag. Why is he not more famous? And Lewis, yeah. because of Civil War. And, right. and the movie Getty. Yeah, but the, the third great grandson I told you, his name is George Lewis Armstead. So, <laughs> <laughs> so they, uh, they, they, they do. But again, and I also think, why is George Armistead not more famous? Because he died early. I mean, other heroes of the War of 1812, Andrew Jackson, <laughs> You know, Zachary Taylor became president. Winfield Scott led the U.S. Army and ran for president. George Armistead would have been one of those guys. I have no doubt he would have had some prom whether he would have been president or not. He would have had some prominent role. The Army guys who won wars were the or did well in wars got those positions. There were other from, the, but because he died so early, uh, and because no one, because I found a lot of people surprised that the anthem didn't become the anthem until 1931. So that was long after he had died, long after anyone remembered the battle had died. So it's that connection. It's that first, that photo in 1907. Most Americans didn't even know the flag existed from Fort McKenna. And even at that point, it's still not the anthem. People knew the song was a popular song, but it's not the national anthem. So had it for some reason become the national anthem in 1818, this story would have been well told already. We would know it's just kind of process of how, how that will happen. They did, there were several attempts through the 1800s and early 1900s to come up with an end. They had contests and they all fizzled. Nobody came up with a song that anybody really liked. So, they just, and, and now, you know, kind of you hear sometimes when you, there, obviously there's a lot of stuff about the anthem in recent years, but sometimes you'll just hear, why is it so militaristic? Well, those are people who don't understand the history. I mean, that's not Francis Scott Key's fault. He was ready. He, he just wrote about him. He wrote about a battle that he witnessed. He wrote about it two days after the battle. That's why it is. If you read that song, he writes sequentially. We actually sing the wrong verse. He does not declare victory until the second verse. The first verse ends with a question mark because he's not sure. By the time he wrote it, he knew, but he's writing about his experiences of Washington. Is it still there? That's what he's asking. There are, three, there are two question marks in that first verse. It's not to the second verse that ends with an exclamation point that he said that he knows the U.S. has won, and then he moves on. He puts his tradition in the third verse and wraps it up in the fourth. So if you read all four verses, most people don't even know there were four verses. You can see what he was doing. And again, it was two days after the battle. So he didn't, the other thing I say to people, and I wrote in the book, he didn't set out to write an anthem. Like, like that wasn't his purpose. He was merely writing about what he had experienced. And if he'd been unsure, he wouldn't have written it. He was because he was on the, because of all those things coming together. He's on the boat near the bridge. And that's what he was writing about. And it was, you know, long after his death, it becomes the end. So there's a, there's a whole different tale to that too. So sometimes you read about that. It's like, okay. But, you know, we don't, we don't study history anymore. So a lot of people don't know that. But it's good because it leads openings for people like me to write books. Yeah.
what her choice of colors of the flag? How was that? You know, I didn't get too deep in that because the flag was already this. I was trying to do this story. It was already established. You hear some reasons. I, I never found a credible reason. I, I don't know. what You know, and the, the British flag is red, white, blue, too. And we were British. You know, it very well could have could have been that. That's, I, I, I don't know. I think sometimes, you know, myths and development. When we don't have answers, because again, sometimes back then, people don't write the reasons down. And so we have to speculate. And some of the speculation is really intriguing. So it becomes history. But I think even, you know, just somebody was, I was doing some research in the Declaration of Independence and they didn't leave a lot of details right away because they were, they were fighting a war. You know, now we're saying, why didn't you write more of this down? Well, they, were, they weren't they were sure the country was going to survive back then. We have, you have to remember the context of the time sometimes when we have frustrated these guys for not giving us more detail. So... And some of it, you know, that's why we keep studying history, because some of it we will never know and can never know. But we keep looking at it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank Appreciate you. that.